Our Heavenly Father, I thank You that we had the opportunity to sing tonight. There's something wonderful about the music and we can lift our voices and all we're doing is singing to You. And I pray that we're also listening to the words and the words are of praise to You. We took some prayer requests, Father, and we want to pray for Andy who has cancer and apparently is also going blind and I don't know if anything that seems worse and more fearful to me than the thought of blindness. Lord, I ask that you'd work there in a, a mighty way. And for Renee, who has COVID now, Lord, pray that this would not be serious and get over it quickly, as we've seen it happen over the past month to so many family and friends. And Lord, you have blessed them with a short-term illness. Pray for Kathy Pike and his family there and bereavement and Lord, we know that you comfort. And again, we know that we can rejoice. If our, our sister has gone on as a believer, we rejoice in that. Now, Father, I pray that you'd be with us as we briefly go over this portion of Scripture and the message that you have for us tonight. Again, I ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word because without His enlightenment, Father, we cannot see the big truths that we need to see. And even those little words that will jump off the page and have great meaning for us. Be with us, Father, this evening again for open and receptive hearts to your word. And we'll give you the honor and the glory as we pray as always in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Paul writes to the church over in Corinth here in chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The problem, the Corinthian church, I mean, you could not throw anything in there without finding a problem. And there's a problem here with some of them. And we'll be looking at that because they are thinking that because they have been baptized and they've gone through the Lord's table, that they're no longer susceptible to trials and temptations. Oh, they're perfect. When we come to Jesus for salvation, we are free. And this is something that, of course, the Apostle Paul spoke of often. But even though we're free, right here Paul gives us a very sober reminder that we are also human. And if we're human, then we're going to have problems. And we're never going to be totally perfect in this world. We know that. You know, Paul had used his own life as an example. And that example is what we should do with our freedom. Now he turns our attention to the original question about idolatry that was back in chapter 10. That has always been a major problem with the world. They always want to worship something instead of worshiping God. 
They let things get in the way. So with this, we have a sudden change of thought. You know, this morning, I went from one chapter, at the end of one chapter into another because the train of thought didn't break with a chapter break. Here, it's a perfect spot because it looks as if Paul, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, we need to speak to these people about some sorts of idolatry that made their way, it's made its way into the lives of those in Corinth. You know, Christians, this is an easy thing for us to do. We need to be on guard against it because it will slide through the door, under the cracks. You know, Jesus says he'll knock, he comes through the door. He only comes if he's invited. But for those of you who remember the old TV series Columbo, you remember Columbo? He would come through the front door, he'd come through the window, he'd come up through the cellar. That's the way Satan is. He, anyway, if there's any way you can get in, he comes. And he brings that idolatry with him and those temptations. I have to admit that I've always enjoyed studying history, certain, certain parts of history more than others. But until I studied church history and seminary, I really had a limited knowledge of church history. In, a, in our Sunday schools or whatever, we hit the highlights, but we don't always hit the lowlights of church history. And we need to look at that. And part of the course that we required to take was church history, including that of missions. And I wondered about having to study church history. I said, you know, studying church history doesn't, that take my time away from studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, those things that we, we think are so important. But it really aided me in seeing God's plan and purpose more clearly. It also helped me see my place in his plan. When you forget history, you're bound to repeat it. You know, Paul talked about forgetting the past. He's not talking about forgetting history. He's talking about forgetting the things that bog you down. Now, how is it that we can remember those things, but we can't remember the important lessons that have been taught to us in Scripture? So we need to be able to build upon those things. We build upon the successes, and we also need to learn from the failures. So Paul is continuing his appeal to the Corinthians here, those believers, for unity. Disunity was a problem there. We know that. Uh, and it's a problem in the earthly church today that continues. We know that too. Paul does this by reminding them of the important lessons they can learn from history. Now, he's not talking about Roman history. He's not talking about Greek history or the Medes and the Persians. He's talking about this history. You have to remember that church in Corinth did not have 66 books and a Bible in front of them. They had the Old Testament writing. And what is the Old Testament? I know it's divided into the books of the law, the books of poetry and prophecy and history, but it is history for them. That is their history book. That's what they needed to be studying. They needed to take a good long look, as we do, with God's relationship to Israel in times past, and that will help us to understand those things which build us up and those things which are going to be destructive to us. Basically, when we look back at what God has done, we see what works and what doesn't work. What frees us and what enslaves us and what pleases God and what brings judgment. And all of this is recorded in God's holy word. You ever wonder why God had all these things placed in the Bible? I've often said, if the Bible were a man-written book, man would never look bad. He would never be attributed with any sin, any crime, nothing. He would be so perfect, it'd make your head spin. But the Bible shows us who we are, what we are. God doesn't miss words, and it's there for a purpose. So he's going to tell them, don't you feel secure in ceremony? We've, uh, you know, we watch a lot of old movies, and we watch a lot of British TV, and we watch these people who are involved in religions that include ceremony. 
And people take so much pride in the ceremony and they get all big headed. And we were watching a movie about, I don't know if you remember or not, when the, uh, over in, what was it? Uh, over in Thailand, thank you. Where the young soccer team went in the cave and they got trapped for all those days. And we were watching that and all the Buddhists were, oh, we insulted the God of the forest. Oh, forgive. And they go through all these ceremonies and they think these ceremonies do something. And evidently the church in Corinth was taking that same approach. These ceremonies will free us. And so as I read 1 Corinthians, especially from the general mood of Paul's words here, it seems obvious there were individuals in the church in Corinth who felt that once they had been baptized and had partaken of the Lord's table, although we've taken in these this, this ceremonies, they were immune to temptation of idol worship. Wouldn't that be nice if that were that simple? But it is not. But we know, it seems, a person who takes shots are supposed to be immune against contagious diseases and, and feeling that everything's going to be all right. And so they go and they mix around people who have the disease. And they find out that, well, the shot might be good, but I still get sick. It's the same principle here. It's spiritual now. Yeah, they get the feeling that we are invulnerable to all these things. We have gone through the ceremonies. And once we've been baptized, we've taken the Lord's table. We're immune to any danger. That's why we know that's not true. It would be wonderful if we were no longer tempted and no longer to, to have idols in front of us. But this frame of mind was dramatically displayed in the experience of the leader of a large city who reached out to his pastor in a time of crisis. He had an office and a skyscraper way up. You know why? So he wouldn't have to listen to the noise of the street. So he had it way up there. Besides being a big, important civic leader, he owned an oil drilling company and owned a great amount of real estate and a fleet of barges that carried cargo on the intercoastal waterways and that sort of thing. He had translated his money into power and status in the community. And he had access to congressmen and judges who had been elected with his assistance by his money and his influence. He was married and he had an expensive portrait of his family that was displayed prominently behind his desk on a shelf. And yet at the same time, he had the several mistresses located in fancy condos around with ever considering divorcing his wife. His pastor came to him in an effort to help his teenage son. He had some bizarre behavior going on and it was interpreted by the pastor as a sign that the young man needed help and he wanted, it was in an effort to get attention from his father. His father was too busy with making money to can be concerned about his son. And that powerful, wealthy businessman said, Pastor, I can't understand something like this, how it could happen to me. And here's what he spelled out his formula for why it couldn't happen to him. He said he felt he should have been protected. I was christened as a baby by devout parents. At 12, I went through confirmation class and took communion. I pledged generously every year to the parish budget. I've done the same thing for my son that my parents have done for me. What happened? He's depending on ceremony to take care of all the problems. You see what he's doing? He's blaming God too. Do you understand? He's just like Adam in the garden. The woman you gave me. Why don't people take the responsibility themselves instead of blaming God? But his question was an invitation for the pastor to tell him, what Paul told the Corinthians, don't find your security in ceremonies of religion, find instead the living God himself. And this is what so many people are dependent upon those ceremonies. So many people, I'm speaking right now today, place trust in some sort of ceremony that's gonna give them an immune system, spiritually speaking. So Paul faced this problem with those in Corinth 
To help make this point, he illustrated the folly of trusting sermons religion to protect the Christian from temptation. What Paul did was he reached back in history, but not secular history. He reached back to the history of Israel. He reached back to the Word of God. I'll grant you probably the majority of those people in Corinth who had come to know the Lord were Gentiles of the past. But there probably were some Jewish believers. You know, you can't get away from them. They're everywhere. Whether you believe it or not, the Jewish believers are all over the world, especially in the early church. And so they're now ready to share. Paul's going to let them share the Gentile believers with the history of the Israel. I say this because only the Bible they possessed, again, at that time, was the Old Testament. God's dealing with Israel. It's important for them to know and to study the Old Testament, just as it's important for us to know and study it. I've had people say, well, why in the world do you spend so much time looking at the Old Testament, studying the Old Testament, preaching on it, teaching on it? Because we need to know it. If God's promises to Israel are no good, what are the promises to the church? But we know that God can't lie. We watch what God has done for Israel and what we, he will do because he made the promise to Abraham. And we know the promises to us are important. So in history, the rights and the wrongs are there for us. So we need to learn history. Paul makes crossing the Red Sea a kind of eating of the manna and take it, drinking the water God provided us a Lord's Supper type of experience. I want to read these first four verses again so maybe you'll see what I'm talking about. Talking to those bit Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye be ignorant. Remember, ignorance can be cured. Ignorant, tell somebody they're ignorant, it doesn't, it's not a, really an insult because you can learn and you won't be ignorant anymore. Ye should not be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual rock for the drink of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock is Christ. Notice the importance of what Paul said. He emphasizes one all. In a, all our fathers were under the cloud. All were baptized unto Moses. All ate the same spiritual meat. All drank the same spiritual drink. This is important. He's, he's telling the Corinthians, now I want you to listen carefully because what I'm going to tell you, all of Israel did this. But what happened to them? They all went through ceremony, if you will. He points out that the Israelites were baptized into Christ, so to speak. But Paul also reminds us that the majority of those who had this experience did not please God with their lives and as a result they died in the desert. Several things happened over those years. They come right up to the border of the Holy Land. They send out the spies and ten of them come back with their knees knocking talking about giants with no faith in God. Only Joshua was in, excuse me my mind is really blank tonight. But they were they believed and they survived. But the others didn't they died in the in the wilderness. And even after the things that the nation had experienced directly from the lay hand of God, Israel had still participated in the worship of idols and in gross sexual immorality. Before Moses could come down with the Ten Commandments, they had fashioned a golden calf. I always it amazes me when I read that section. And, and you listen to Aaron, and that calf just popped out of the fire by itself, didn't it? Never took responsibility. And they had continued to be unwilling to trust God for their provision. They wouldn't go into the land, and as a result, they died in the desert. Paul intended this to be a very serious warning to the Corinthians. Paul's warning is straightforward. Don't rely on ceremonies of religion to protect you. He said, God is interested in how you live your life. Not in those ceremonies. You know, we take of the Lord's table, we are remembering what He did for us. There's nothing 
that gives us supernatural power to resist temptation, but we look back on those, that great sacrifice he made that we can be free. Paul does not just pull out one example, though. You know, when you pull out one example, people are going to say, well, but what about? So he lists a number of lessons which needed to be learned and which must be acted upon if we're to make it out of this world. Now remember, even though some of these verses seem to be tied to some particular action and situations in Corinth, they're very relevant for people trying to live the Christian life today. There's, you know, the Bible's amazing. Even though this was written 2,000 years ago to a church who had problems, we have the same problems today and the advice is still good. It never changes. God's Word is truth. We live in a secular world, a world which has no room for God and no desire to know Him, even to learn about Him. If the world had its way, it would remove every Bible, burn down every church, and make it illegal to say anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. You look at me like I've got a hole in my head, but if the world were in control, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. And what's going to happen in the tribulation? If God didn't seal that 144,000 witnesses from the 12 tribes of Israel, the Word of God would just disappear. Because the world has no time for Him, no place for Him, no belief in Him. We live in a godless society, and this makes the Christian life and the Christian walk so difficult. That's why we have to realize, as I said this morning, we are residents of heaven, citizens of heaven, and aliens here. So Paul states that most of these things were negative by prohibition. He says you shouldn't do this, but if you reverse and state them positively, he gives us a, boy, what a basis for an ethical life. In verse 6 he says, we should not lust after evil things. And it becomes, learn to desire what is good for you. you know, sometimes you have to look, and you look at the negative, and you say, well, this is the positive. Verse 7, neither be idolaters. That can best be translated for today. Don't let anything replace God in your affection. Wow. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. It's a positive call to put our sexual desire drives and our expression in the context of love and commitment. Neither let us tempt Christ. That recalls a time when the Israelites grew impatient with God's provision. And for us, it's a positive call to trust Him for our needs. And verse 10, Neither murmur ye, ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? It's a reference to the frequent murmurings of the Israelites, but it's a call for us to keep positive and a wholesome spirit. Boy, it's easy to murmur. Oh, we, can, we only gripe about everything, don't we? We do. We like, and don't tell me you don't, because we do, and I wish I didn't, but I gripe, and I groan. It's difficult at times to match up to the lifestyle God wants us to live with, you know, with various ceremonies and rituals that are so much a part of our life. Reminds me of a story. I've got a lot of stories. I, I got, got, got quit reading so much. Maybe my sermons will be shorter. But it's a story about a, a mother came to her pastor one evening and on which the last of her four children were baptized. She said, she's been baptized into the church. She took her handkerchief and she wiped some perspiration off her brow. She took a deep breath with a smile of relief and at last they're all in the church and I can stop worrying. Be nice if it was that easy, wouldn't it? The pastor, knowing her four children well, knowing the kinds of pressure and the temptations that were laying ahead for them, wondered if she hadn't relaxed just a little bit too soon that's because what was still ahead of these young people was the pressure to make materialism their God, to treat sex as nothing more than an appetite to be satisfied any way they wanted, the temptation to create their dream world by using drugs and alcohol and well, scores of other temptations. 
just because we've come to Jesus, just because we've been baptized, doesn't mean that those things aren't out there in front of us. Even if you're 70 or 80 years old, they're still out there. It doesn't mean we're immune to them. Although the mother and her happiness about her children's commitment to Christ, you know, she didn't really hear him. All she could think about is that they're saved. That's wonderful. Her pastor let her know that it was only the first step that they had taken and that the real work was just beginning. There is nothing that you didn't put on a suit of armor when you came up out of that water. There is still a battle to be won out in front of you. When her children, what her children really needed to know was how they were going to have to deal with the trials and temptations they're going to face as they worked at building their Christian lives. All of those things would be many and they're going to be varied and they're going to be extremely difficult to resist. It's hard to resist the world out there, isn't it? When it dangles that golden ring in front of you as you ride by. For you little ones, you don't know what I'm talking about because they don't do that anymore, I guess, at the riding. Paul's concern for his friends in Corinth was that they were setting themselves up for a great fall by trusting in ceremony, feeling they were immune. And with that in mind, an inspiration of the Holy Spirit guiding him, he gives them some very pointed and practical advice, and it is still good advice for us today. Here again, the Corinthians were to learn by the experiences of Israel. We use that too. But now we have the entire canon of Scripture and we can learn from what Paul's telling them. History. First, we need to be realistic about both trials that we face and our own strength to resist them. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's a warning against the unfounded pride and a call to humble ourselves about our own strength. It's like the old commercial, I'm stepping back in time. You remember, it was, I think it was a headache commercial. Mother, please, I'd rather do it myself. Don't we do that a lot? When we have a problem or a temptation, rather than saying, God, help me, we say, I can do it myself. And you know what? We can't. On our own, we're going to fail every single time. How often do we talk about pride and the danger that it causes in our lives? It's our pride. It, it's that kind of an easy thing for a Christian to make enemies, which will face them like, like oh, we can, we can face that problem like a straw man, burn him up. We think we can push him aside and with a verse of scripture or some religious platitude, it doesn't work. It seems we forget or perhaps we never consider that actually powerful, persuasive, persistent opponents who often invade our minds and hearts, take us captive before we even know that they're near. They use a sneak attack on us. That's why we have to be aware of everything going on. Let me say this loud and clear. The evil which is controlled by the evil one himself, the prince of the power of the air, he will, the way that we face in this life is a master of disguise. And frequently he changes the, the levels on things that, the labels that things confuse us. He'll, he changes the word here, changes the appearance there. Remember, he's a liar and the father of lies. He's not going to tell you the truth. He may put just enough, it's right in there, but it's a lie. That's what you have to keep in mind. You cannot believe him. You cannot trust anything he says or does. And yet time after time, he convinces you to do the wrong thing. He convinces you, but you make the choice. The old thing, the devil made me do it. Uh-uh, that doesn't work. He doesn't make you do it. You do it yourself. Have you ever given any thought today about political correctness and what's really behind it? Well, let's take a look at some of the things which invade our minds and therefore they, it invades our thinking. It's interesting that what God calls fornication, or thou shalt not commit adultery, today it's refined and referred to as sexually liberated. How about that? 
And with those words being over and over again used to our young people, they begin to forget what God says. Not even young people at all. Oh, well, I'm liberated. I can do what I want. And those two words have been branded into our hearts and minds by me as people, including born-again Christians have allowed that to happen. It's a subtle way of enticing the Christian into sin by thinking like the world that fornication is not a sin. But what is important and what the world thinks is not. What is important is what God thinks. What does God say? God doesn't say, I think it's wrong. He says, it's wrong. I've watched Christians be seduced by materialism so subtle that they had a religious feeling about it. One of the best defenses we have is to become realistic about the temptations of the world in which we live and be honest about our own limited spiritual resources that we have. On our own, we are weak and we are helpless and we listen to the, the world as they water down the Word of God. And if you watch what they do, they begin to, it's a trickle down effect. At first, they just weaken it and then they weaken a little more and before you know it, it's gone. I've watched that in my life. I've watched, when I was in elementary school, we started every day with the Lord's Prayer and, and with Pledge of Allegiance. And we prayed before we went to lunch and you had Bible readings. And then before long, they took out this, they took out that, and now it's not there. And they've done it to the country, they've done it to the world. Secondly, Paul told his readers not to feel exempt from trials. And brother and sister, that includes us. Don't feel like you're ever going to be exempt from them. If you're a believer and you're walking on this earth, you're going to be sure of one thing, trials are going to come. There's no way to avoid them, but that doesn't mean we have to give in to them. You know, follow the Bible. You know, if, if you know you have a problem with something, you have to do like you read over and in, in Sol Solomon writes about if you see, so I'm paraphrasing, if this place or this thing is something that leads you into temptation, leads you into sin, you take the long way around, you avoid it. That's how we would put it today. But yet so often we think, well, I'm strong enough, I'm going to go right through the middle of it. And you get in the middle of it and you become involved in it. The good news is that we are assured that there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who shall not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Never give in because no temptation God is going to allow to come to you that you can't handle with His help. He's not going to take you and put you over the edge. That's not going to happen. If He gets you to the edge, He's going to have His arms around you. You're not going to fall. And these are wonderful words of assurance for two groups of people. Those who feel they are Christians and that they are not going to face any certain temptations, they're reminded that trials and temptations are common for everybody. Don't think too high-minded of yourself that it's not going to happen to you. And that means you and that means me. Paul alludes to this truth later when writing to the church over at Philippi, and he says that he has been, I love what he says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. I, Paul says, I've been tempted. I have seen these things. I know the trials. I know the temptations. But God is faithful. That's what we always need to remember. What Paul says here basically, and I'm sure is a huge shock to all those who have felt that they had a relationship with Christ as, and that's an exemption to problems. Now Paul said, if I have these problems, you're going to have these problems. Think about it. Paul, what a great man Paul was. And yet he says, I'm a sinner. I have temptations. I do what I shouldn't do. You're not exempt. But on the other hand, 
to the people who are going through difficult times, this passage is a source of great assurance that they are not alone. And you know, you're never alone. Sometimes you feel like you're on an island. You feel like there's no help anywhere. He's in here. And He's right here around you. It's very much like getting on the ark. Noah, come in the ark. God went before him. Who shut the door on the ark? God. He came behind him. And God's always... He went with Moses before him. He went with him. He was behind him. And that's where He is with us. We are never alone. Sometimes we're all a bit paranoid about the suffering we go through. And we look around and we get the feeling that everyone else is having an easy time while we alone are having a hard time. But you see, we're looking the wrong way because that's not true. If you look around at other people and their trials and their temptations and their problems, you'll say, there but by the grace of God go I. Because no matter how sick you are, no matter how bad you feel, no matter what the trouble is, somebody over here is in worse shape. Rather than saying, oh, woe is me, you say, thank you, God, that I'm in better condition, better shape, better position than this man. Finally, Paul tells us, you know, this is a common lot for all humans. But he gave his readers two great words of assurance about their trials and temptations. First, God would set limits on what He would allow to happen to them. God is faithful and He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. There is this statement to the idea that's found in other places of the Bible. You know, God knows us. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. You know what? God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what we can take. And He knows when our weak points. And I want to tell you something else. So does the devil. He may not know. He doesn't know us like God knows us. But he's, He and His demons are around enough to know your weaknesses. And when you get puffed up, that is a good biblical word, by the way. When you get puffed up, that's when He, that's when he hits you. When that pride is elevated, He's going to attack. When you think you're immune to something, He's going to attack. When you're winning people to Christ, He's going to attack. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're never to be overcome by evil because we are going to. Evil's going to attack us. But even in our failure, that's not going to result in having more on our plate than we can handle. Even when it just He's attacking us from all sides, our plate isn't full. The great promise of this passage is there it's nothing that any of us will face in this life that will be so overwhelming that we can't turn to God for help. When you feel your knees buckle, it's because you haven't turned to Him and said, Lord, help me. You ever get the feeling that you're bothering God? Don't answer. I know, the, I know that answer. Well, it's not important enough, God. I, I'm not going to bother. Take it to Him. Little problems, big problems, little pains, big Take it to the Lord. You wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep. You know what you do? You take it to the Lord. There's something in your heart. You just ask the Holy Spirit, pray for me. Show me how to pray. What's in my, what do I need to say? And you'll be surprised what you can say. And you'll be asleep before you finish that prayer. Nothing is too small. Second, Paul assures us that but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Boy, this promise is one that I personally tested over and over and over again, and I found out without any doubt this is absolutely true. He always gives us a way to escape. The problem is we don't want to take it. There was an old saying that when God closes the door, He opens the window, He does that with temptation. All we have, well, I'm too old to climb through that window. No, you're not. If God gives you a place to go, to get out of that, go. He's going to make it for you. There have been times that I've tried in my own strength to deal with problems. And you know what? The problems got worse. But on every occasion I've asked God for help, He's never refused. He's always given it. God always gives us an escape plan. 
And I always think of you know, when I read this, talk about this, like football. You're running back, what do you do? You run to daylight. You have a problem, you run to the light. That's Jesus Christ. We only need to open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual gear, ears to God's leading. And that temptation, you'll find that it's going to be laying right out there in the middle of the road, but you're going to be over here because God is going to give you a way to escape. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the time that we had this evening. And as always, I ask that the Holy Spirit be working in every heart according to the need of each individual. I know that we have those on our prayer list, Father, that are some are sick, some have worries, some may be facing, well, death. But the most important decision is what to do with Jesus Christ. And I pray that no one would leave here tonight until they have spoken with you and accepted Jesus as Savior, not just with words, but with a heart of understanding. Whatever the need, Father, work in a mighty way in every heart, and we'll give you the honor and the glory as always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know you are our